Iconic university ensnared in a sex abuse scandal involving young boys. The question, did a legendary football coach do enough to stop it? In 2002, when a graduate assistant claimed to see Sandusky raping a boy roughly 10 years old in the team showers. The next morning, the assistant went to Paterno's home and told him what he saw. 2002, Mike McQuarrie, current Penn State wide receivers coach, then a grad assistant. He saw Sandusky raping a young boy in a shower. If you witness a rape, you call the police. You don't call your supervisor. A graduate assistant at the time reported seeing Sandusky raping a 10-year-old. Guys, he should have been guys, beat there down. Is, there are no, sometimes there are graves. This is the most horrific yes. thing you can do. It's pretty disturbing. Here's a man that was told that a 10-year-old boy was being sodomized in his backyard and did nothing about it. The mothers of two of the alleged victims criticized the university administration and Joe Paterno. Two mothers told reporter Sarah Ganim they feel betrayed by Penn State. Those quotes are so powerful and they resonate through central Pennsylvania and I'm sure much farther than that. News into Sports Center, a source at Penn State says support for Joe Paterno is eroding among the school's board of trustees. Why didn't he meet with reporters? Who was Whose call was that? Well, uh, apparently it was the university's call most likely from the president Spanier. Joe Paterno has decided to retire to suggest that uh, that this will be enough to satisfy many people out there seems to fall way short. This is behavior that cannot be tolerated and he does not get to dictate the terms of his departure from Penn State. Uh, with the benefit of hindsight I wish I had done more and there are certainly some that out there that are echoing those sentiments. If anything a statement I wish I had done more raises even more questions. Yeah. The parallels with the Roman Catholic Church well, and the sexual abuse we've seen thing. unmasked the, over the last 30 the or 40 thing. years. The first thing in his legacy should be a picture of the faces and the pain scarred into the eyes of the boys whose abuse, whose further abuse, he could have prevented. The Penn State child sex abuse scandal entered a fifth day. By consensus, now the most appalling story ever connected to college sports. Penn State's Joe Paterno may be on his way out tonight in the wake of these revelations about a child sex abuse scandal involving one of his assistant coaches. School officials were aware of alleged assaults inside the locker room shower in both 2000 and 2002. But Paterno has been criticized for not telling the police. There's been denial expressed by people who say, well, let's just figure out what the facts are. They have to get past this, and the only way for that to happen is for him and perhaps the university president and others to resign. Because you cannot watch a football game Saturday and be thinking about child molestation, and that's exactly what you will be thinking about if you see that man on those sidelines. That's why he was fired. And Joe almost says that very fact in his brief statement. I think it was absolutely the right decision. Um, this was a complete collapse, legally, morally, um, and, and in every other way. People think they know the story of the Jerry Sandusky scandal, but they don't. The media created a largely false narrative to fit their own agenda. And not only is there no evidence currently that Joe Paterno was the villain of this situation, had the media wanted to, they actually could have made Joe Paterno the hero of this case. In fact, they almost did. On the day of the indictments, Sarah Ganim, who would later win a Pulitzer Prize for her coverage, wrote a story with a clear source, headline, Penn State coach Paterno praised for acting appropriately in reporting Jerry Sandusky sex abuse suspicions. That's stunning in retrospect. As that article said, he was being praised. And uh, if our board of trustees would have done that the night of November 9th, everything would be different for Penn State. If they would have let Joe Paterno make a statement and be the face of Penn State during these most troubling times, things would be different. Well, on November 9th, I definitely wasn't expecting the firing of Joe Paterno. Joe Paterno is no longer the head football coach. Be effective immediately. I mean, hit me like a ton of bricks.
I was not ready for that. I couldn't believe what I was watching. I, I was shell-shocked. I'm hollering at the television. I could not believe that my school could do this to a man who had given us 61 years. They knew the man. And for them to throw him under the proverbial bus, based on a 23-page document to me, was unfathomable. I was outraged. I was fuming. I, I never felt that rage and anger ever before. I can't describe the anger I felt at that particular moment, and you know, that's still with me. And that's not gonna go until we get some, we, we, we know what happened here. And I texted uh, Dave Joyner, one of the board members and former teammate of mine. I texted him, can't believe you guys did that. You guys are a bunch of wusses. You know, you guys, you know, don't have any strength. And I just can't believe that that, that you did that. I am um, a bit puzzled by the timing of the presentment. I am doubtful that, that there weren't some consequences intended beyond indicting Jerry Sandusky and Tim Curley and Gary Schultz. The Attorney General putting those words, uh, anal intercourse, in the presentment was, was completely careless. And to me, it was, it was highly unethical to kind of go outside the bounds of what, what, what was actually testified to. We now know, months later, that the presentment had a very significant error in it, in that the presentment states that Mike McQuarrie reported anal rape. We know that that's just untrue. And so I wonder, because I, I have to believe that the prosecution also knew that to be untrue. I wonder how that happened. Certainly as an attorney and a, as a former prosecutor, um, it, it, it really raises a lot of questions to me. Uh, what, what's really going on here? Why would they put that in here? Now it didn't matter what the truth is. They painted this lie as a truth. And now people have this in their mind and this is what they're picturing. And I can understand the outrage. Ironically, one of three charges for which Jerry Sandusky is acquitted revolve around that charge of, of Mike McCreary witnessing anal rape. The reality is that Joe Paternal and Penn State did not react like they had a five alarm fire on their hands because they weren't told by Mike McCreary that they had a five alarm fire on their hands. And the most likely reason why they weren't told that because Mike McQuarrie didn't see a five alarm fire back in 2001. So much so, he couldn't even remember what the year was. Think about how damning that is in terms of his credibility. Take Dr. Dranoff, for example. He's a mandated reporter for sexual abuse involving kids. And what he tells us is that Mike McQuarrie never said those things, never talked about sex or sex acts. I know he didn't see a sexual assault. I asked Mike McQuarrie, about that and and I asked him if if he saw intercourse and he said no. I asked him if he saw sodomy, he said no. So he did not see any sexual assault. Having visited the physical space where, where the episode occurred, I I have questions as to whether someone could have have witnessed what they claim to have witnessed in the time frame they said this occurred. And I asked Mike, I said, Mike, what did you tell Joe Paterno uh, that day he went over there? And he said, well, you know what, Franco, uh, like I really wasn't able to explain things in detail because it's Joe. And, and so I, I really got the impression that, you know, he really couldn't say much to Joe and that he didn't say much to Joe. Joe had just been diagnosed with um, cancer, and uh, I wanted to, to, to meet with him, to pay my, my respects and, and, and talk with him a little bit about the situation. Joe told me that Mike had told him about seeing Jerry in, in the shower and something about horseplay or horsing around and that it made him uncomfortable. Uh, he didn't use any sexual overtones in, in, or any terms with sexual overtones when he, he told me what uh, about his 
conversation with McQueary. He didn't use any words with sexual overtones. I found it odd that, that Joe's grand jury testimony used words like sexual and fondling because those aren't words that would come out of his mouth. You know, we all now know that he didn't know what sodomy was. So it won't surprise me if we learn at some point that in preparation for his grand jury testimony, Joe spent time with some people to help refresh his recollection because he did not remember the conversation in 2001. Well, the theory that Joe uh, maybe wanted to refresh his memory uh, and met with Mike McQueary um, to, to chat about his, his grand jury testimony, I think that, that may be very valid. And, and some of those terms may have seeped in there. Um, that very well could have happened. If something like that happened, then a lot of the entire case against Joe Paterno falls apart. Oh, yes. Uh, if it did happen, I think uh, Joe should be, you know, exonerated, certainly. Well, after speaking with Mike, you know, I felt confident that he really didn't tell Joe much and that Joe really didn't know anything. How could he call the police directly? I know Mike McQuarrie, but I would describe it as kind of a rocky relationship with, with Coach McQuarrie. Um, we didn't always get along. Um, I feel like my sophomore year, a lot of events transpired where I was falsely accused of things. I mean, I'm a, a academic All-American two-time and graduated with like a 394 GPA, and they have me, you know, trying to, to blame me for things that were occurring, you know, off the field issues. I've never been in trouble in my life. And yet, you know, Mike was wrong, wrongly trying to accuse me of some things, I think, and, and it, you know, cost me some playing time at Penn State. It cost me some time. Based upon your experiences in a disciplinary matter with Mike McQuarrie, do you believe him to be trustworthy? In my case, no. I didn't trust him at that point in time. And even after that, I was always a little concerned about his motivation with everything. So I wouldn't be surprised if Mike McQuarrie's story ultimately in the trial, Curly Schultz, it didn't, didn't hold because you have other folks who will testify to what he told them. The most stunning thing we've learned in the last year is that the alleged victim in the Mike McQuarrie episode is on record saying that nothing ever happened. So much so that the prosecution now is trying to claim in court that he doesn't even exist. They would rather have there be no known victim in that episode than the person who is actually the person coming forward to say, I was in the shower with Jerry Sandusky because he doesn't back up Mike McQueary's story, which is the only way you can make all the rest of this story make any sense at all. I think the, the Commonwealth found itself in a, a very difficult situation. The Commonwealth was aware that, that, that the person who said that he was number two had spoken to us and had given an exculpatory version of what happened, meaning that he said Jerry Sandusky didn't do anything sexual with him, not only that night, but ever. So you don't believe that victim two was abused in the shower that night? I, I do not. I never did. Jerry created a, a, a wonderful persona. It, w it would have been unbelievable to believe that he was a pedophile. I thought I, I knew him very well. I spent a lot of time with him and I couldn't conceive of him doing the things that he supposedly have, has done. Uh, and that's the way most people in State College viewed him. They viewed him as a saint. So he groomed the whole town. He got the whole town used to him seeing him around boys, so it wasn't anything unusual. And as a, as a matter of fact, people looked at it as a positive thing. When the presentment came down, I was uh, shocked. I, I had, uh, in the year up to that point, I had tried to help Jerry to, to sort of sort through what he thought was going to be how he was going to be attacked in, in the grand jury. And um, we had met several occasions and tried to figure out uh, what he could be accused of. And um, he had about three events that he thought might be a possibility. He used to get calls from people who had testified uh, at the grand jury saying, 
I said this, this, and this. So he had, he had an idea of what was happening. So Jerry tells you about these three episodes he's concerned about. Right. Why doesn't he mention the McQuarrie episode to you? I don't know that he even thought it was an episode. That's probably the best. Uh, and it may not have been an episode. It, he might have just been, you know, screwing around in the showers without, you know, any sexual aspect to it. And if that is the case, then all of this, from a Penn State perspective, has been much ado about not very much. That is correct. Uh, it, if that was the case, Penn State, Tim Curley, Gary Schultz, Joe Paterno, Graham Spanier should all be okay. Spanier resigns and Paterno is fired. No one else is speaking for the university. There's a, there's a void. And the media was very happy to fill that void with its narrative. And that narrative was Penn State scandal. Jerry Sandusky was not, not an employee of Penn State. Jerry Sandusky was running the second mile. So what was their role in all of this? And why haven't we focused more attention on the second mile? In the absence of, of leadership, when Graham Spanier and Joe Paterno were no longer here as the voices of Penn State, the media had a free reign. The media coverage of this case, I jump back to the week Coach Paterno was fired, November 2011, and I'm scared. 90% of what they said was false, complete fiction. They, I mean, I know all the players involved. It makes me kind of sad to live in a society where it's better to sensationalize everything to make money than it is to actually get the truth. So, a few days after this all broke, Jerry was arrested. The media was swarming the Paterno home. Jerry Sandusky, who worked out at the same gym where I worked out, uh, Jerry and his wife Dottie came into the gym, worked out, walked out of the gym. There wasn't a single media person there. At the same time, Joe Paterno couldn't get in and out of his house without swarms of media being present. How difficult would it have been for the media to find Jerry Sandusky? Piece of cake. I feel uh, angry uh, beyond description related to uh, the behavior of the media. ESPN, the hypocrisy uh, of, of, of people like those on ESPN who seem to totally uh, disregard what happened at Syracuse and their role and involvement in that. The amazing thing is people don't even know about the Syracuse case and they certainly don't know about ESPN's role in covering that up. There was a tape that ESPN and reporter Mark Schwartz had for many years in which Bernie Fine, the pedophile from Syracuse basketball team until he was fired last year, his wife is speaking to one of the accusers admitting that she knows her husband was abusing him. And yet ESPN sat on this for many years and the reporter who had the tape, Mark Schwartz, finds himself the day after Paterno's firing in front of Paterno's house moralizing about protecting the victims. Well, I think before we talk about the university and the football team, we have to talk about the victims here. So then somehow ESPN decides it's a great idea to have Mark Schwartz be the sideline reporter for the first Penn State home game after Paterno's death. I see this, I can't believe it. So I go down on the field after the game, after he's done his job, and I say, Mark, can I ask you a question? Can I just ask you a couple questions about the media coverage of Penn State? No. I want to ask you about the fact that you protected a pedophile for several years in the Bernie Fine case. Yes, ESPN oh, really? did. Okay. You did. You had a tape. Good so do you, you find that ironic that you're covering Penn State for a network that destroyed Penn State, Mark? You had more information than Joe Paterno did, Mark. Wow. So why didn't you act? Why didn't you act, Mark? Who is this guy? Why didn't you? You don't Who want to answer a simple question about why you don't think that you're a pedophile protector? You're supposed to be a journalist. You work for a network that destroyed Penn State knowing far less than what you knew about Bernie Fine. Why is that, Mark? The media Why did narrative, you do that? What, what sells is a, an icon being knocked down. It just does. And in the absence of any support by the institution that knew him best, it, it becomes a free fall. It's just so easy for them to assail Joe Paterno. It really is. 
you know, it's, it's like a, a fight without an opponent. You sit there and you keep punching and nobody's there to fight back. Well, if you look at the media reaction to the free report, we had the press conference at 10 a.m. And, and it was supposed to come out at 9 a.m. And no one could really read and analyze an hour anyway. And then Louis Free just went over the summary. The press, everybody bought into it. And, and then what was really quite amazing when how many people used the summary and never really read the report. One thing that Paterno's supporters always maintained and he himself maintained before he died was that he had no knowledge of the 1998 investigation into Sandusky's misconduct. And that because he didn't know about it, that had no impact on the decision to allow Jerry Sandusky to retire, if you will, with an honorable discharge in 1999. According to the Free Report, that is not the case. Those were lies. And then you had other people base their opinions on that news report who just got their information just from the summary. And so it was ridiculous. I was stunned, shocked. I think those are the best words, that this is the work product of, of a person who, who was the FBI director. I was startled by the lack of any kind of sufficient evidence to back up these, these uh, hellacious claims that he made, in particular as it relates to, to uh, Coach Paterno. I look at the free report, and it does exonerate Joe Paterno. And really, as, as I said, it shows that there was no cover-up, no conspiracy. In my time in the Department of Defense, I've seen some cover-ups. It's preposterous that it was a cover-up. Um, a cover-up would, would have, Joe would have shut Mike up from the get-go. Mike would have never testified before the grand jury to what he did. Joe would have never said what he did. Uh, I mean, that's just, so it's just, it's, it's just, it's make-believe in Louis Free's mind. A number of times when I spoke with Jerry about this very issue, was there a cover-up? Could there have been, was there any conversation between you, Jim Curley, Gary Schultz, uh, Graham Spanier, about what you supposedly were doing and, 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 and their efforts to maybe kind of conceal it? He said, Joe, absolutely not, never. They're openly communicating with each other on university email. And it remains to be seen what Joe actually uh, said or didn't say because he wasn't in any of those emails. But, you know, Spanier, Curley, Schultz, I mean, they're openly talking about this. There's nothing I've seen yet that would lead me to believe that there was a concealment on any level. And until someone can share with me that smoking gun, uh, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that Louis Free's conclusion was appropriate. I'll tell you just the opposite. He reached conclusions based on facts that aren't in evidence. To, to believe free, you have to believe that Joe Paterno knew in 1998 that uh, that Jerry Zandusky was a pedophile. There is no conclusive evidence that he did know anything occurred in 1998, was even aware about the investigation. But even if you, you assume that he did, um, you had law enforcement, you had Department of Public Welfare, you had all of the relevant folks involved with that investigation. And all of them concluded the same thing, that Jerry Zandusky did nothing wrong, and therefore he was not charged with anything. Yet, if you believe Louis Free, would, you, Joe Paterno would have to have known every detail and say, you know what, they were wrong, he was a pedophile, and I should treat him as a pedophile, starting in 1998. The record shows there's no direct evidence that Paterno was ever told about 1998. Wait a minute, I thought that uh, Sally Jenkins said that he lied and that uh, you know, he's, he committed perjury, and uh, Louis Free says he knew about 98. To believe that Paterno knew everything about 98, that it was a child sexual abuse investigation, first, uh, doesn't fit logically with the law. Okay. It would have been against the law for him to know that. Sally Jenkins, who I uh, in ex exchanged emails with, basically said that because Tim Curley was Joe Paterno's lackey, Curley would have told Paterno everything. Louis Free's assertion that Coach is assumed to be Paterno is, is uh, ludicrous, in a word. Why do you believe that's ludicrous? Well, first, I go back to the law. Who is the person who has to be informed within 24 or 48 hours of the incident? Jerry Sandusky. How did, was Jerry Sandusky referred to as by most people around second mile in the football team? He liked to be called the coach. Joe Paterno was known as Joe. I'm on the record early on when the free investigation began as having said it should come as no surprise what the outcome will be. 
and it's going to be blame the dead guy and the three administrators who aren't here anymore. That's an easy solution. I could have saved us six and a half million dollars and written that, that report then. But we had to wait, and in July the report was released, and what did it say? Well, the dead guy and three administrators are guilty of concealment to avoid bad publicity. Oh well, I mean, that's a real shocker. Bad publicity, really, Coach Paterno really caring about bad publicity. Um, I can't see it. Joe didn't care, good publicity, bad publicity. Joe was Joe. For people to say that Coach Paterno uh, feared bad publicity is ridiculous to me because uh, when, when I was caught in a situation and, and I was being charged with aggravated assault against a police officer, it was a bad time for the university, it was a bad time for me, um, it was a bad time for Coach Paterno. Uh, the media really went after him. If he feared bad publicity, he would have got rid of me at that time. To say that he did that be to avoid bad publicity, I mean, that's so absurd that how do you really answer that? I, I know in my heart that if, if Coach Paterno thought I had anything to do with this situation, he would have sat me fast. Uh, we had guys that, that, that could have came up and played behind me. I seen an instance where he sat two of the best players on our team because they didn't do well in school. It is impossible to believe that if he knew something like this occurred, he would be the last person, the last person to sit there and, and not do anything. That's not the Joe that I know, and certainly the Joe that thousands of us know, and it's, it's just not believable. And, um, and, and you know, to be quite frank, there is no evidence to support it. The conclusion and the summary that Mr. Free had to come to, I strongly believe, was to really support the Board of Trustees and justify what they did. It certainly looked as though uh, Louis Free had a conclusion in mind and then tried to fit the scant evidence that he did have to fit that conclusion. Why was Louis Free hired? Why does a guy who can't talk to any of the major players in this put out a report that jumps to conclusions with a summary that apparently is even more inaccurate than his report and doesn't support some of the things he makes in his report, has a press conference immediately to say this for everyone on earth to hear before anyone's even had a chance to read the report. Why was it even made public? Why is the narrative, hey, let's just move forward. Let's just accept the worst sanctions in NCAA history and just move forward. Um, who's lying between the NCAA and Rodney Erickson? You have President Erickson saying, we were threatened with a four-year death penalty, so I accepted these, these essentially four-year death penalty sanctions. And you have the NCAA saying, that was never on the table. Who's lying? Why were all these decisions made? Because the NCAA launched no investigation. They went completely above their, and beyond and out of the realm of their own bylaws. After we fired Joe Paterno, we announced that we're going to do an investigation of what's happened here. We hire Louis Free to conduct that investigation. And Louis Free releases his report. The day that it's released, we say we accept responsibility for the findings in the report. In effect, accepting the report, though as a board, my first board meeting, we've never had a discussion about the actual contents of the document, nor have we actually taken a vote as to whether we agree with what's in the document. But the moment we do that, the NCAA views that as an acceptance. And so what had been originally a criminal matter, now in their mind becomes a matter under their control. And over the course of the next seven days, a consent agreement is reached. And that consent agreement, if you read it, hinges in large part on the free report. And so in that period of time, from firing Joe Paterno to the release of the free report, we went from bad to worse. If we lose due process here in our country, that we have a real big problem. If we let the media, you know, the media, you know, fast opinions and decisions, really count as being due process and the decisions that they make are final, then we're in big trouble here in our country. If we lose that fundamental right for due process. Well, I'm not gonna rest, and I know folks like Frank Will Harris won't, there's a hell of a lot more of us that aren't. We're not gonna move forward until we get the truth. And we're not gonna let this board and this president continue to act like 
we're bad people. Because that football program, our football program, is, was and continues to be the model by which every football program in this country is judged. We are who we are, and we're not, we're not gonna back down from that. That's who we are. That's, there's no myth there. It's success with honor. I, I'm gonna defend him till I'm not here anymore. Uh, because I, I really believe in what, what he stood for. I believe in uh, the things he instilled in us as, as young men. Um, and, and he always preached to us that you, you get your education and, and then you go back and, and you, you, you help others. And, I, that, and to me, um, that's the Coach Paterno I knew. Uh, that's the Coach Paterno I love. Yes, I'm a board of trustee member and I want to move forward in the worst way but I am not gonna move forward at the expense of Joe Paterno and what he's given this university because, believe it or not, so much of what people feel for Penn State is a result of a man named Joe Paterno. The connection they feel to this university is because of a man named Joe Paterno. And you could remove a statue, you can take his name off of a building, it won't matter. The memories exist. I just wanna know what the truth is, that's it. It's, it's a pretty simple request, it seems to me, John. It's a, it's a simple request. And yet, there are very few people who are out there willing to do what you're willing to do to help get to the truth. Wherever that takes us, it sure as hell isn't coming from the media. The media is no longer constructed to handle a story as complex as this one because we don't have the attention spans and the media doesn't have the expertise. They don't care about details, they don't care about the facts. And that's part of why we're doing this documentary, to get the real truth out there. But we need help, we need support. We can't do this alone. This is the hardest thing we've ever done. We're going uphill into the wind on ice with lead bricks around our feet because everybody's against us on this. The only thing we've got going for us is the truth. And I don't know if that's gonna be enough or not. I hope it is, I actually have my doubts. But the truth has gotta still matter. And we're gonna find out when we do this documentary whether it still does.